we've been looking at the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. That God has given us the promise of His Spirit. And we've done a couple of messages on it already. This morning we're going to continue that series. A few weeks ago, uh, before we started the series, I talked with you about uh, the Jewish festival of Shavuot, Pentecost. And in, in the festival of Pentecost, we took a quick look at uh, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai because the Jews kind of uh, put that in with that, that festival. So this morning, we're going to kind of pick up a little bit on that as we look at this idea that the Holy Spirit is with us. And if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus chapter 19. That's where I'm going to get started, and we'll move from there. So uh, a little bit odd, maybe, to think that we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit this morning. We're starting back in Exodus. But you'll see where we're going, and I think you'll understand that, that the Holy Spirit is with us. God is present with us, and that's a wonderful gift. So Exodus chapter 19 is where we begin uh, this morning. Exodus 19, verse 10. Now, God had delivered the people of Israel out of Egypt and led them through the wilderness to this mountain. And God was going to give them the law. But before Moses went up on the mountain, before the law was given, God gave Moses instructions on what, would be, what needed to be done before God showed up to speak to his people. And God was going to speak the law to them personally. So here's what God says to Moses. Uh, Exodus 19 verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. God was planning to come down on top of the mountain in front of everybody. But before he did that, he wanted everyone to consecrate themselves. Consecrate means to uh, set apart, to make yourself separate. Uh, it, it, mean, it has this idea of cleanliness uh, and purity. So God is holy and pure and righteous and just. And in his sight, he can't tolerate sin. So the people had to set themselves apart from sin and to clean themselves. And they even had to clean their clothes as a symbol of the fact that they were uh, consecrating themselves inwardly as well. Next verse, verse 12. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. The people could not even touch the mountain where God was going to come down. If you remember when, uh, when Moses was in the wilderness and God uh, appeared in a form of a burning bush and spoke to him from the bush, he said, Moses, this is holy ground. It was holy ground because God was present. And God was going to be present on that mountain and that mountain was going to be holy ground. And so nobody was allowed to touch the mountain. And they had to put barriers up to kind of keep people back so that they wouldn't approach uh, and touch the mountain. Verses 16, we're going to drop down to verse 16 and 17. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Can you imagine that moment? God descends from the heavens to this mountain and there's a, this giant cloud covers over the mountain and the, and the mountain actually shakes and trembles at the presence of God. And everyone in the camp was terrified. I would have been terrified. We would have all been terrified if we had been there and seen that thing happen in front of us. And then it just sounds almost, almost comical to me. God takes the people out to meet with God. Come on, everybody, we're going to meet God today. He's, at, he's on the mountain, and we're all going to go out to meet with him. But they were afraid. They were terrified. Listen to what verse 18 says. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from, the, from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. This was, uh, there hasn't been a movie made that could capture how incredible this scene must have been. God in the form of fire descending down on this mountain. And huge billows of smoke coming out of it. There's thunder. There's lightning. There's the sound of trumpets. And, and God's voice billows out to the people. They were absolutely petrified. This is God's presence. Now, thinking about it, 
I can't imagine why you would need barriers. I don't know of anybody who would have been ready to rush up and touch that mountain with all of this scene going on. And yet God speaks to his people from the mountain. And the people are so terrified, they told Moses, please don't ever let God do that to us again. You speak to God and then you come tell us what he said. We don't want God to speak to us anymore. Because they were so scared. But Moses, after seeing all of that that went on, Moses went up on that mountain to see, to see God. That was an incredible, amazing day. Uh, and I just can't even imagine what it would have been like to be among the Israelites and see the presence of God come in a, in a powerful way like that. But you know what? God was present with the Israelites as they wandered through the wilderness. You probably remember the story, but God, God was with them day and night. And he made a visible form so that they could see that he was with them. He made a pillar of cloud by day, and at night there was fire in the cloud so that they could see. And this, it's not that God is cloud or fire, but God made this as a demonstration of his presence. So that they could have something with their eyes to see. Because God is spirit and we can't see God. And, and if we saw God in all of his glory, it would kill us. But God created something special just so that they could experience his presence with them. So here they have this cloud by day and at night it had fire in it. Uh, Exodus 13, 21 tells us, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud nor the, by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. In other words, God was always there. God was always there. And he gave them that special symbol to show them that he was present. That God was present with them. Then, then God, while Moses went up on the mountain, God gave him instructions uh, on building the tabernacle. Not just giving him the law, but also instructions on building a tabernacle. The tabernacle was designed to serve as a place that would uh, be where people would go to meet with God. And so there would be an altar there that they could offer sacrifices. There would be a place for the Ark of the Covenant that they would build, which would symbolize the presence of God in, a, in, the, in the inner sanction of that tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. And God's presence was in there. And so Moses built this tabernacle exactly like God said to build it. And this was designed to kind of be a central focus so that people would know this is where God is. God's presence is here with us. I want to read to you from Exodus 40 what happened after they built the tabernacle and set it up for the first time. Listen to this. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whether the cloud, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. So they watched that cloud, and when the cloud lifted up, they knew it was time to break camp and move out. And then they just went wherever the cloud went. God was guiding them through the wilderness. They didn't go anywhere if the cloud didn't uh, lift. Because that meant that God wanted them to stay exactly where they are. Wouldn't it be nice today if God would do that for us? If God would just like make this little cloud and we would just know exactly where we're supposed to go and what we're supposed to do and we could just follow that cloud through life and, and you know if the cloud settled down and stopped then we stopped too and we would just wait on God and, and then when he's ready for us to move on the cloud would pick up and go and we'd just follow the cloud. Wouldn't it be great if God would just lead us? Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but even though I'm a pastor, I just have this hard time hearing. And it's not because I'm getting old. It's just that I just have this hard time hearing sometimes and knowing, what is God speaking? Where is he leading? What is he wanting me to do? Sometimes it's clear as a bell. But there are other times when I, I struggle to hear the voice of God. And I just... Sometimes I, I think it'd be kind of cool if he would just lead us. Here's what Moses said, 30, Exodus 33, 15. Moses said to him, speaking of the Lord, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. 
If your presence does not go with us, don't send us. Moses is saying, if you're not going with us, we're not leaving. We're not going to go if you don't go with us. Wouldn't it be great if you and I would have that same attitude? We're not going to go anywhere that God's not leading us to go. Now that would be nice. I'm not going to go anywhere in my thought life that God doesn't want me to go and won't be with me. I'm not going to go anywhere in my work life, in, in my entertainment life. I'm not going to go anywhere that God isn't with me. That would be a good way to live. Moses says, we, it's not worth it for us to go out there and face whatever we face if you're not with us because we're doomed. And you and I are doomed as well if the presence of God is not with us. And so we need to have the same attitude uh, that, that they had and to, to realize that we need God with us. Now, we have this scene in the Old Testament. God's presence is with Israel. He sets up a tabernacle that reminds them of his presence. And inside is this uh, sanctuary called the Holy of Holies. It's the innermost room. And they have this ark inside of there. And that is a representation of God's presence. Now, of course, we know that God can't be contained in a building. God can't be contained in a little box. But it was a reminder to them that this is the place where God's presence is. They had to have some visual reminder of where God is. So keep that in the, in the back of your mind and we'll move on. Now we move to the time of Christ. Something wonderful happened when God showed up in the form of man. Hebrews 1.3 says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being. He is not just similar to God. Jesus is not just very much like God. Jesus is not just a representative of God. He is God. He is the exact representation of all that God is. All of his power, all of his glory, all of his divinity is within Jesus. Jesus is the, not only the Son of God, we say the Son of God, but he is God. Exactly. That, um, that word that you see there, the exact representation is a Greek word called character. It's like a stamp. It's an exact duplicate. Jesus is God. He is the Lord Almighty. Matthew one twenty two says this. Uh, all this took place. To, and, and Matthew is talking about the birth of Christ, by the way. He says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet... The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. God with us. And he was quoting from Isaiah. But the prophet said that a son would be born, his name would be Emmanuel. The name Emmanuel means God with us. He is with us. Jesus is God with us. So when Jesus walked around with his disciples, when, when he taught people, when he healed the sick, that was God in the flesh walking on earth, being with his people. God, Emmanuel, God with us. Wow. It's one thing to have a cloud that you follow around or, or a fire, but it's completely different when the presence of God is in the form of humanity so that we can relate, so that we can communicate, so that we can identify. You can't identify with a cloud, but you can identify with, a, with another human being. And so God's, God came down in the form of man, his own creation, so that he could relate to us, so that he could be with us. What better way to gather around a group of disciples and teach them than to be one of them? If, if you wanted to, uh, to teach ants how to do something, well, the best way to do it would be to become an ant because there's no way you and I can communicate with ants. But if we, if we were ants, we could talk to them. But we're not. And we can't even do that. But God did something even more spectacular when he became like us to relate to us, to teach us. 
When the Israelites in the wilderness heard the voice of God from the mountain, from smoke and fire, they were listening to God's voice. But when the disciples were walking along the road and talking with Jesus, they were hearing the voice of God. When the Israelites escaped from Pharaoh's hand and, and, and God uh, let them walk through the Red Sea and held up the waters beside them, that was God delivering them. When the, it, when, when the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee and the storms rose up, Jesus stood up and with his command calmed the seas. The same God saved the Israelites and saved the disciples in the boat. When the Israelites were in the wilderness, they ate manna that came from heaven and onto the ground and just picked it up and they were able to eat bread that God gave them. And the disciples were able to eat bread that Jesus broke in the desert and handed out from two loaves and five fish and made, of, uh, made just baskets full, feeding a multitude of people. The same God who fed the Israelites in the wilderness was the same God who fed the people in the desert in Jesus' day. So we, we need to relate these things together and understand it's the same God in the Old Testament that it is in the New Testament. But now he's, he's come down to be like us. He's present in, the, in Jesus rather than a, a cloud or a fire. Matthew or, or Mark chapter 3. Jesus, one of the first things he did as he began his ministry was to choose disciples Mark chapter 3, verse 13 through 15 says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Those that Jesus called had two jobs. Job number one, to be with Jesus. That's it. Now, job two was to preach and cast out demons, but job one was more important. Job one is just to be with Jesus. Being with Jesus is more important than doing anything for Jesus. Being with Jesus is more important than any kind of ministry that you and I can do. Being with Jesus is job one. And that was the disciples' number one job. Jesus called them to be with him. Just being in his presence. How many times have you ever just wanted to be in his presence? That song we say, the more I seek you, the more I find you. When do we seek after him? When do we look to be with him? I think that's so important. And I think it's something we miss out on so much. But Jesus called his disciples to be with him. And they were. And so for three years or so, Jesus walked around uh, Israel and the disciples went with him and, and uh, he taught them and he, he demonstrated how to do ministry and they did ministry with him and he sent them out on training missions and so they had all this time training but the day was coming when Jesus was going to have to leave and he knew that. He knew that he was going to be crucified and rise from the dead but then he would have to leave this earth and go back to heaven to the place uh, where he came from. And Jesus knew that the disciples were still going to need help because they weren't quite ready to be on their own. In fact, you and I will never be ready to be on our own because God, we always need God's help to be with us. And so Jesus told them that he would not leave them. Here's what he said, John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. We looked at this last week. Uh, I, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus says, I am going to go to the Father. But when I do, I'm going to send you another advocate. Another, uh, some versions call it counselor. Some versions call it comforter. Some versions call it helper. The Greek word is parakletos and it's, uh, it's where we get the, the word paraclete. It's, it's one of these words that there's really not an English word that we can use that would capture all of what it means to be this paraclete. In the Greek, it meant uh, a legal advocate or counsel for defense. That would be like, uh, in today's terms, uh, an attorney who, who um, 
plead your case before a judge. Or it could mean, uh, the second thing it could mean is an intercessor, someone who intercedes for you on your behalf. Or it could mean just a helper in general. So all of these kinds of ideas, and most of the time in uh, Greek culture, that word was used to speak of legal counsel. It was used in a legal sense. But that, that word, it does mean an advocate. It does mean a, a counselor. It does mean a comforter. And it does mean a helper. It means all of those things. The, the Holy Spirit is all of those things to us. And we're so fortunate, so blessed to have the Holy Spirit be with us. Jesus says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to just go off and leave you. I'm going to leave another counselor to be with you. I'm going to leave the, the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be, instead of being with you, he's going to be in you. Because what did Jesus say? He said, he's been with you. You know who he is. He's been with you. Who was with them? Jesus was with them. He said, he's been with you, but now he's going to be in you. Jesus was with them in the flesh, but then soon he would be in them in the spirit. That's pretty profound, actually. The same God who spoke from fire on a mountain lives in you. Wow. The same God who parted the Red Sea lives in you. The same God who in Jesus um, gave sight to the blind and raised the dead and cast out demons lives in you. The same God. Not a different God. Not a different form of God. But God in his glory and power resides within you. He is with us. He is with us today. The first Pentecost, God came down in fire on a mountain and spoke to his people from a distance and they had to stay back. But in Acts, when Pentecost came, God did it different. The fire came down on the people themselves and God spoke through their mouths. That was a different kind of Pentecost. And it was a different kind of presence. You see, in the Old Testament, the presence of God is way over there. It's holy. It's amazing. It's powerful. We don't dare touch it. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes within us. And the presence of God is now inside of us. And no longer is the presence of God out there somewhere. But now the presence of God is within us. That's a huge profound difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Same God, same powerful presence, but now instead of untouchable, removed from us, now within us. Very big difference. When Jesus died on the cross, something amazing happened. In Mark 15, 38, it's recorded, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. These are big curtains we have on our stage. Big curtains. The curtain in the temple was bigger than these curtains. And thicker. And it tore not from the bottom up where the people were. But from the top down where God was. <laughs> God reached down to the temple and he tore the curtain open. Revealing the inner sanctum. The holy of holies. The place where God's presence was. It was a symbolic act whereby God was saying, I am now opening the doors so that anyone can come into my presence. No longer am I going to hide behind a curtain. No longer am I going to be on an untouchable mountain. Now I will live within you. I will be your God and you will be my people. That's the kind of God we serve today. A God who is with us. The holy presence of the Lord lives in us. Now that's pretty amazing. Let's go back to John 14 where we were earlier. Oh, before we get there. Th this, this is neat. When you and I are worshiping God, Think about this for just a minute. When we worship the Lord, we're here in, in this place on this hill at 2345 Columbiana Road in 
Birmingham, Alabama, in the United States on planet Earth. We are at, where is it? 33 degrees north and 86 degrees west. Right here. This is the location where we are. But let me tell you something. We might be physically right here when we're worshiping God. But spiritually we are in the presence of the Lord. We are in his holy temple. We are before his very throne. And every time we come here to worship the Lord, we're not just at this place. We're not just at a church, at Horizon Church. We're in the presence of a divine creator. We are worshiping the Lord and he is with us in this place. And we need to remember that when we come here to worship. It's not about you. It's not about the other people around you. It's about you and me in the presence of God Almighty giving all that we are to him. All of our heart to him. We're in his presence. His presence. Oh man, I love that. Hmm. We are, Ephesians says, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Seated with, we are, we are physically here, but spiritually we're with God. Oh, that's, that's neat stuff. We'll go into that another day. All right. John 14, 18. I want to get back to John 14. Uh, after Jesus said, I'm going to leave you another advocate that he's with you and he will be in you. Here's what he said after that in verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's the Greek word orphanos. Sounds just like orphans, doesn't it? Because it means exactly that. I'm not going to leave you fatherless. I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. That's a pretty neat thing that Jesus said to his disciples. I'm not going to leave you like someone who, who leaves their kids. Today's Father's Day, and I kind of wanted to take on this thought that God is our Father. He is our Heavenly Father. And Jesus said to his disciples, I'm not going to leave you fatherless. And he doesn't leave us fatherless. We have a Father who loves us. A father who is awesome. A father who is great. You know that video we watched, I told you how awesome it would be if your dad was the number one jujitsu fighter and he was the one training you. What if your dad was number one in the universe of everything? <laughs> now that's awesome. That's pretty awesome. My dad's number one, but he's number one of everything in the whole universe. That's pretty cool. But what's not cool is what's happening in our country. Because we are becoming a fatherless society. It is a, a plague like cancer that is sweeping across this nation. It is getting worse and worse as the years go by. To find a family that remains intact for life is becoming rare. Today, uh, statistics show that 43% of children live in a fatherless home. 43% almost half of the kids in this nation have no father in their home no father in their home what happens when kids don't have a father boys growing up without a father are twice as likely to end up in jail and you just click it for each one of those thank you honey boys growing up without a father are twice as likely to end up in jail 70% of kids in juvenile detention centers are from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides are kids from a fatherless home. 85% of children with behavior disorders come from a fatherless home. 71% of all high school dropouts come from a fatherless home. 90% of homeless and runaway children are from a fatherless home. 75% of all adolescents in drug rehab centers are from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists are motivated with displaced anger from a fatherless home. 71% of pregnant teens are from a fatherless home. 90% of adolescent repeat arsonists are from a fatherless home. Those are mind-blowing statistics. What happens when the dad leaves is profound. And it's disgraceful. 
Children from low-income, two-parent families outperform students from high-income, single-parent homes. Really? Almost twice as many high achievers come from two-parent homes as one-parent homes. It's not really all about income. It's about having a stable home life with two parents. That's more important. Uh, the likelihood that a young male will engage in criminal activities doubles if he is raised without a father and triples if he lives in a neighborhood with a high concentration of single parent families. We are creating a disaster in this nation by, by having fatherless homes. Now I say this for a couple of reasons. One is to say to any fathers, stick with it. Hang in there. Don't walk out. Don't run away. Hang in there and do the job that you have been called to do. If you're a dad, then raise your kids. Don't walk out on them. And it might not necessarily be people in here, but somebody who's watching on the internet. You need to stick with it. You need to do your job. Hang in there and be a dad. But the second thing is this. All those statistics look pretty horrible. But they're just statistics. None of them are 100%. If you were raised without a dad, or if you're being raised now without a dad, if, if you had a bad father, as a bad example, those statistics are not 100%. You don't have to be one of those that doesn't succeed. You don't have to be. Because we can change that. You can have good role models at church or in your community, or at school. And more important than any of that is you can have the best role model of all, and that is your heavenly Father. And He can trump any statistic. God can, can, can do away with any of those negative statistics in your life. God can make something out of nothing. Surely, He can help us when we are at a disadvantage. Do you know that our heavenly Father actually takes care of those who are disadvantaged. God cares for the orphans and he cares for the widows. God cares for those people who are, who are at, at uh, risk of being taken advantage of. God especially watches over them. And I don't think there's anything more important for us to understand this morning than to know this, that the Heavenly Father who loves us, is with us, and he's our protector. He's our strong tower. He is our shield. He is the one who watches over us, and he will be with us. And we don't have to be a statistic. We don't have to be like one of those. We can be something because God is something. And we need to always remember that. I was raised in a good home with two parents and a, and a great dad. My dad could do anything he put his mind to. He could. And he taught me a million things. And I'm so blessed because of that. So blessed because I, all the stuff I know, I, I, I know stuff because my mom and my dad taught me so much when I was a kid. And I'm blessed from that. But I know not everybody has been blessed to have a good home life. But I do know this. God will make up the difference. God will make up the difference. You don't have to fear you don't have to be afraid. Here's what the Bible says about our Heavenly Father. Psalm 68, 5. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. This is the God that you serve. He is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. God is your father and he cares for you and he shapes you and he molds you. you know, that's the job of an earthly father to shape and mold their, their children into adults, productive adults. But God does the same thing. God shapes us. God molds us. God creates us into something wonderful. When Jesus taught us how to pray, he said, pray like this, our father who is in heaven. It doesn't matter if you don't have an earthly father. You have a heavenly father. And that's how you should pray. Our father who is in heaven. You're my dad. You're my dad. 
when uh, speaking about how the Father cares for us in Matthew 6, 26. I read this last week in, the, in our little money minute section. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father, who? Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? We're so much more valuable than little birds. Aren't we? And our heavenly Father, if he takes care of little sparrows, don't you know that he takes care of us? God watches over us. There isn't a need that you have that he doesn't already know about. There's not a hair that falls off your head that God doesn't already know about it. Some of, them, some of us have kept him busy more than others, you know, calculating how many hairs fall off. But God knows them all. God takes care of us. He is our heavenly Father. Before Jesus left, he wanted the disciples to understand, I am not leaving you as orphans. I'm not abandoning you. Don't think that I'm walking out on you. I'm just changing the way we relate. I'm still going to be with you. But it's going to be a little different. Instead of being uh, in the form of a man walking with you on the side of the road, I'm going to be inside of you. I'll be the voice of, the, of God inside of you. That's incredible. Luke eleven thirteen. Here's something else Jesus said. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We are imperfect at best. And yet we know how to raise our kids and take care of them and grow them up into productive human beings. And we know how to give them uh, the right kinds of foods to eat. We know better than to give them... Uh, you know, instead of giving them a stone, we'll give them bread to eat. We know they can't eat rocks. We're, we're smart enough to know that. But God is so much better. And God cares about us. Now, I love my kids. I love both of them to death. But you know, God loves my kids more than I do. That's pretty awesome. And Jesus says, your father will give you good things if you ask. You know what, we're so often afraid of what God's going to give us. You say, oh, no, yeah, we are. We're afraid of what God's going to give us. And a lot of times we don't even ask God for stuff because we're afraid of what he's going to say or what he will do. And we think somehow that if we ask God for something, then, then God's going to, you know, it, it used to be, the old saying used to be, oh, God, I'll do anything, but oh, God, don't call me to be a missionary to Africa. You know, people used to say that when they were praying. See, people are really afraid to ask God for things. And when we pray and we say, God, oh, I'll do anything for you, we don't really mean that because there are things that we won't do for God. You say, well, not me, I'll do, no, yeah, all of us. We all are like that. We have a bit of fear within us that, that, that keeps us from being really open to what God wants to do in our lives and we're afraid. You know, when, when we're little children and we're, we're standing on the bed and our father says, jump into my arms, we think nothing about it and we just go, jump. But as we grow up, we become less trusting. And, and a lot of us are are, some of us are, are more trusting than others. But as we grow up, we become less trusting and we even are less trusting of God than when we were children. And so somehow we get this thing in our mind that if we ask God for something, that he's going to do something that we're not going to like because we've heard stories of something that happened to somebody else. God knows what you need better than you know what you need. God knows what's good for your life better than you know what's good for your life. And if, if you ask for God, if you ask God for anything, he will give you what's good. He will give you what's good. If we ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit, he'll give us the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be afraid that something else is going to happen to you that's, that's weird or that's out there. If you ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit, he'll give you the Holy Spirit. Paul's letter to the Romans, he said this, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Do you remember that image we had earlier today of the Israelites being led in the wilderness by the cloud by day and the fire by night? Those who are 
led by the Spirit of God or the children of God, we also can be led by God. We don't have to have a cloud. We don't have to have the fire. We have the Holy Spirit. We are led by the Holy Spirit. Instead of being an outer, outward voice, He is an inward voice. And so the Lord does still guide us. He does still lead us. And He speaks from within. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received, that's the Spirit that you and I asked for, the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit who comes into us. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. We don't have to live in fear. We don't. Because the spirit we receive from Jesus is not a spirit of fear. It's a spirit of love. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic word. And, uh, Aramaic was a common language spoken by the people in Jesus' day. And it was a word that would be similar to our daddy. Daddy. It's a, an endearing term. It's a, a term of intimacy. You and I have an intimate connection with God through the Holy Spirit. He lives in us, connects us to the throne, and by His Spirit we can cry out to God and cry out, Abba, Daddy, oh God, my Father. We've been blessed with the presence of God. Jesus said, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. You won't be fatherless. I'm giving you a father that will be with you forever. What did Jesus say before he left earth? He, he, he gave them last instructions, but one of the things that he said near the very end, and it's at the end of the book of Matthew, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you till the very end. You can depend on Jesus. You can trust Him to be there. He is. He is God with us. Emmanuel. That's the promise of the Spirit to be present with us.